what my father did um, in response to his origin story is look outward. He decided that he wanted to commit his life to telling stories of injustice. Not just the stories of injustice um, uh, in the context of Jews, but the stories of injustice in the context of anywhere, anyone who is facing um, this kind of hate. So he became a filmmaker. My method of activism was the facts. <laughs> so, so in the early 90s, as a child activist, I used the facts to try to reach people, right? Uh, there was a particularly funny campaign that I ran in the early 90s. It was the Gulf War, where I got on the radio and I said to everybody, um, send a fax to the Intercontinental Hotel in Geneva uh, on the eve of the Gulf War, where the US uh, Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of Iraq were meeting, and try to convince them not to start this war. I think the big question we face today, right, in 2017, as we think about how to fight this huge upsurge in hate that has been the topic of, of today and that many people around the country are talking, we need to understand what's really changed, and it's much more than just technology. And we need to understand how to prosecute that fight today when fax machines certainly are not enough. I think the right way to have that conversation is to think about how power is changing. And so uh, with my colleague, Henry Timms, who runs the 92nd Street Y in New York, we developed this framework that we first published in Harvard Business Review, which I want to share a little bit with you today. So old power meet new power. What's the difference between these two ways of exercising power? So you could think of old power as something that you hold like a currency. The more of that currency that you have, the more powerful you are, right? So the job with old power is to hoard it. Now, exercising new power requires a very different lens, right? With new power, you need to think of it more as a current. It's something you can't really fully shape or control, right? Because it's something that surges, right? It's most powerful, like water or electricity, when it surges like a current. You can think of old power as something that's held by a few. You can think of new power as something that's made by many. The models that new power uh, involves require the mass participation of all of us. Old power downloads, new power uploads. So let's think about this in the context of something that's been unfolding uh, over the last few weeks, right? Let's think about these two very different uh, ways to exercise power represented by Harvey Weinstein on the left and uh, by the Me Too movement on the right. So Weinstein totally embodies this old power method, right? For him, power was a currency. He would divvy out favors and rewards. He had the power to destroy a movie or make a movie, to give an actor a part or to deny an actor that part. You know, he buffeted himself with an army of lawyers protecting himself. And so uh, we see Weinstein is using old power in order to protect his position. Now, the Me Too movement, I think, is fascinating because it was born with this one tweet right, by Alyssa Milano, but it then grew and surged like a current. It's still surging like a current all over the world, right? It's traveling through geographies, it's traveling through industries, it's toppling leaders, it's unsettling old power structures, and it's changing norms as we do it. So the big question I want to talk to you about today is, in the context of the fact that hate spreads so fast, we see that with ISIS, we see that in many ways with the rise of white supremacy today, how can we make sure that love spreads faster? And so one of the ways we need to do that is understand the way values have changed. If you think about how young people are organizing and engaging with the world today, we have to meet them where they are. They're expecting a level of radical transparency, um, which means that we can't just figure this out without them behind closed doors. They want to make the solution. They want to be intricately involved in the ways that solutions are forged. I think the first thing that we need to think of is in a new power world, it's very easy for people to get co-opted, right? Donald Trump's methodology was to build a fervent crowd and appeal to his most extreme supporters. He deployed new power very cynically to you know, advance what is a pretty authoritarian agenda. But he also is trying to divide people, right? And we saw this in 2016, where he tried to co-opt the LGBT community um, in order to preach hate against Muslim Americans. We're going to need, as we heard earlier today, I thought very strikingly, um, the technology community to be with us. 
we know that these technology platforms, these big new power platforms like Facebook that rely on our participation, right, are also fueled by extremism. So while the algorithms now are geared to extremism, and they're geared, frankly, to things that we cannot control, dials we cannot turn, we need to think instead of what a public interest algorithm could look like, an algorithm that we had control over. Let's come back to the Me Too movement for a minute and think about what's made that so effective. The first thing that's been really effective about that is that the, the idea of Me Too is inherently actionable, right? The ask, Me Too, immediately asks someone to come forward with their own story or to share the story of someone else. Secondly, Me Too makes us feel like we're part of something bigger. The glue of Me Too has been the fact that no one is alone. And thirdly, and this is really critical as we think about the hunger for people now to participate. Uh, the idea was extensible. People could make it their own, they could adapt it, they could change it. This is just a photo from, from just a couple days ago in Hollywood at one of the Me Too protests that spilt out onto the streets. This is clearly someone who's taken the Me Too idea and made it extensible. And so as we think about the kind of world we want to build, we have to think about how to build intensity Right? Not around hate, but around love, around pluralism, around openness, around tolerance. We have to think about how to use new power to fight this good fight. So imagine for a minute this. Imagine a day in which we allow people to self-organize all around the country, right? In churches, in synagogues, in sports teams, in businesses, in communities, um, and both online and offline find their own ways of coming together uh, against hate and building the kind of seed of a long-term community and potentially an annual strategy in which people, communities, come together against hate. So on President's Day 2018, uh, we're announcing a day against hate. As Jeremy described, this phenomenon of new power is real. And so it's not necessarily a function of what we can create from on top, but rather what we can spark from below. Through houses of worship, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, through community groups in our community and in the African American and Latino and LGBTQ and Muslim and other communities, through sports teams, and tomorrow we're gonna to talk about our new sports leadership council at the professional and, and collegiate and high school level, through city halls, through our new mayor's compact that we launched earlier this year in response to Charlottesville with help from Purpose, we now have more than 300 mayors who have signed up to inoculate their communities from intolerance and joined our alliance against hate. And finally, through businesses. And so it's not, again, what these corporations and these faith institutions and these teams can all do from the top, but again, how to get back to what Eric talked about earlier, can we leverage citizens and engage them in this effort? Not just what we're fighting against, but what we're fighting for. And so that's how we're gonna do it. President's Day 2018, a day against hate. Thank you, Jeremy, so much again.